All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for a great, uh, great morning session. Uh, this afternoon's session is supported by Baseball Reference and includes three research presentations and a pair of panel discussions. As a reminder, if you feel this room is a little bit too crowded, or you're looking for a little bit of a uh, quieter space, 267 up at the back is, uh, is available for you folks if, uh, if you need. Uh, we're going to kick off this afternoon with the Sabre Analytics Conference Research Awards. Uh, the Sabre Analytics Conference Research Awards recognize baseball researchers who have completed the best work of original analysis or commentary during the preceding calendar year. Works of analysis are judged based on thorough examination of subject matter, originality of research, factual accuracy, and significance in advancing our understanding of baseball. Works of commentary are judged based on distinguished writing, profound insight, factual accuracy, and significance in understanding or in advancing our understanding of baseball. Uh, nominations are solicited, solicited by representatives from Sabre, Baseball Prospectus, Fangraphs, the Internet Baseball Writers Association of America, and Sports Info Solutions. Voting for the winners is conducted online at Sabre.org, BaseballProspectus.com, Fangraphs.com, and IBWAA.com. All of the finalists for this year's awards can be found on the analytics conference page of Sabre.org. I know we have a few winners in our audience today. Uh, so when your name is called, please do come up to the front here. Uh, our first award today is for contemporary baseball analysis. This award honors the best analysis focusing on a subject related to the modern game, teams, or players. This year's winner is Ben Clemens for how good are those probabilities on Apple TV Plus broadcasts published at fangraphs.com on May 26, 2022. There we go. Thank you so much. Next is our award for Contemporary Baseball Commentary. This award honors the best commentary focusing on a subject related to the modern game, teams, or players. This year's winner is Michael Bowman for the playoffs aren't too small, the league is way too small. I'm sorry, I'm gonna repeat myself, how about that? The playoffs aren't too big, the league is way too small published at Fangraphs.com on October 4th, 2022. Next is historical baseball analysis and or commentary. This award honors the best original analysis or commentary focusing on a subject related to a game, teams, or players throughout baseball history. This year's winner is Mike Petriello for How Many Games Would Springfield's Ringers Win? Published at MLB.com on February 19, 2022. All right, our final award, I do not believe our winner is with us today. Uh, it's also a new award. Uh, this is the John Dewan Defensive Analytics Award, named for the Sports Info Solutions founder and Fielding Bible author. This award honors the best defensive or fielding analysis published or presented in the last year. This year's winner is Russell A. Carlton for So You've Decided to Ban the Shift published at baseballprospectus.com on March 9, 2022. Uh, congratulations again to this year's Sabre Analytics Conference Research Award winners, Ben Clemens, Michael Bauman, Mike Petriello, and Russell A. Carlton. And 
I hope you all will be able to join us again tomorrow morning when we will present this year's Sabre Analytics Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, up next, our first panel discussion of the afternoon, uh, our projections system panel. Our panelists today are Nick Kapoor, Senior Data Scientist at Zealous Analytics, Jake Schuster, CEO at Gemini Sports Analytics, and Meg Rowley, Managing Editor at Fangraphs.com. Our moderator is Ari Kaplan, an MLB front office executive. Hey, thanks, Scott, and thanks everyone for coming here. My name is Ari Kaplan, and it's been an honor. This is starting of my 35th season working professionally with Major League Baseball. Um, uh, started out was one of the first five people to work in an organization uh, in the analytics capacity. So blows my mind to see conference like this, which is the premier of the industry. So thank you all for coming here. And I've had a lot of adventures. I think I'm most known for creating and leading the Chicago Cubs analytics department, but also did the same with the Dodgers and the Orioles. And you know, part of coming into here is learning, you know, how do you modernize everything and what's next, which is why this is going to be a great panel. Um, what's next a lot is projections, but machine learning and data science. So in addition to that, I've also done scouting. So looking at players from the humanistic side and working with them as well. And I've honored many of them uh, ended up in the Hall of Fame uh, that I scouted uh, or the majors, you know, everyone from Hunter Pence recommending that he gets the call to the majors, uh, Trey Mancini, uh, Anthony Rizzo when I was with the Cubs was a big one. So see, uh, when he, the moment the ball touched his glove was when uh, they made the World Series victory. Um, last year was especially fun since Beyond Baseball started branching out. So during q and I'd be happy to share multi-sport projection systems, but I spent the year traveling with McLaren and Formula One, working with drivers at uh, Lando Norris, Daniel Ricardo, and their race strategy team, which was uh, like an adventure, a dream come true. And now um, I work both with sports management worldwide, teaching online sports and baseball analytics, as well as work for Data Bricks, which is the late, the leading modern data and AI company. And specifically for baseball, the, the teams and the leagues and media use it as a platform for all their data engineering, machine learning, data science use cases with like the biggest scalable uh, uh, scalability you could ever imagine. And also at like a huge, like one-tenth the, the cost. So this is the, the new modern data stack, um, which is exciting to be part of that, but wanted to have each of the panelists uh, go ahead and just start off by introducing yourselves. Yeah, hi, uh, Nick Kapoor. Uh, I'm currently a senior data scientist at Zealous Analytics. Uh, we're a consulting company that works with, uh, with teams in a lot of professional sports. Um, uh, before Zealous, uh, I spent four years as a senior analyst at the Dodgers, uh, before that a year with the Yankees, uh, and before that was at NC State uh, in a PhD statistics program. Hi, I'm Jake Schuster. Um, I'm the CEO of a company called Gemini Sports Analytics. We're a software company. Before that, I was a strength and conditioning coach and a sports scientist in the pro sports world. And I'm Meg Rowley. I'm the managing editor of Fangraphs. Um, I do not actually construct our systems, but I oversee all of our editorials. So I think a lot about how we communicate what those projection systems are saying, both to our readers and to other public facing analysts. Great. And uh, zips and steamer and all of that yes. is. Uh, things that teams and fans use alike. So it's a great position to have publicly available projection systems. We tend to think so. <laughs> Which is a challenge since sometimes teams have their own projection systems, but yes. no one in the audience, unless you work for the team, would know exactly how, how it works. So we'll be here as uh, transparent as possible. And uh, Nick, you actually uh, worked with a couple teams as well. Uh, what was it Yankees and the Yankees and Dodgers? Yeah, that's nice. right. So have some access to some or have some knowledge of some of the more proprietary projection systems. But you know, one of the nicest things about the like the uh, pervasiveness of of several different projection systems is you can use them together, right? A, a, an aggregate estimate is often better than any individual estimate is. So uh, you know, at teams 
people are not only using their internal projection system, but also a lot of the public ones to, to make them better and to identify edge cases and things along those lines. Sweet. So yeah, why don't we start off and like, and, and by the way, for all these questions, feel free to answer or skip. I have more than enough to <laughs> fill up the time. We're going to have about 20 minutes of Q&A at the end, but yeah, like only if you want to add something, don't feel like everyone has to uh, unless you want to, but yeah. So what what do projection systems, like what do they mean to you? What are they, like how are they developed and deployed? I think you made a really important point. You know, a, a rising tide lifts all boats and, and it shouldn't be about our model versus someone else's model. You should look at everything together so that we can compare and contrast and find the best answer. Really, I, I think the most important thing when looking at any kind of prediction is setting expectations. So not saying this is a single point, which you'll probably talk about, but this is our level of confidence in that right. point. Right. So what you're often going to see, and I think this is true across the industry, um, when you're looking at public facing projections, you're, you're often looking at sort of the 50th percentile outcome that we might expect for a player, right? And we're going to incorporate a ton of data that is very carefully vetted. Um, I think if you were to talk to someone like Dan Zimborski, who is responsible for the ZIPS projection systems, he would tell you that it takes a very conservative approach to integrating new information because we have all of this fantastic data, but we don't want to be confused about its shininess, meaning that it is predictive. And that's not always going to be true. So Dan will take a lot of time to integrate something into Zips, and that can sometimes be a multi-year process. It's certainly one that he is looking at throughout the season, but he's not trying to jam something in just because it's interesting. He wants to make sure that it's actually telling us something about the player. And then as we aggregate that information up about teams. <laughs> Yeah, and one of one of the biggest things to note about projection systems in general is is to think about things along the like descriptive to predictive scale, right? Met, there are lots of metrics that are descriptive, including war that are that are publicly cited that are used a lot, right? And and what a projection system is doing, like what separates that is they're trying to strip out noise in such a way to make the metric more predictive and so that's that's the the general framework like if there's if there are a couple of tenants to what is a projection system a, attempting to be as predictive as possible is is probably the core tenant cool so yeah one of the things we see like projection systems like way back uh, early on were really simple since all the data they had was box scores and then it became play by play so you could get a higher level of granularity and then like in 2007, Sport Vision came out, which is the predecessor to TrackMan, StatCast, and a lot of the other uh, solutions that you've seen. So you know, why, don't, why don't we just talk about like what type of data could or, or is going into projection systems? You guys want to start? Yeah, I guess um, right at this point, you know, everything imaginable that, that teams have access to or that the, the public sphere has access to is attempting to be incorporated into projection systems, right? And so, you know, I think the idea is, is again, to make things as predictive as possible. And so looking at every bit of information to determine what is predictive and what is not predictive is an important piece of this. You know, it's it's pretty well known that the best predictor of a metric is not necessarily itself, right? FIP and ERA are a good example of this. Past ERA is not the best predictor of future ERA. And so on that and, and further along that line, if there are metrics that come out that are that are hyper predictive if something from the biomechanics work is is hyper predictive, if if you know maximum exit velocity is very predictive, something along those lines people are going to want to incorporate those into their projection systems because that will help increase the accuracy and the speed at which you can accurately tell how good a player is. Uh, so, so really like the data that's being used is, is, is all of it. Any, anything that you see or, or can imagine people have tried to throw into projection systems to make them better. And some of it works and some of it doesn't. And, and when it works, you have to make sure that it's working properly. And when it doesn't, it can also give you insights as to, as to why or, or how to improve things in the future. You mentioned an important word, try. People will try to derive value from new data sources. It's not a guarantee. We all saw the deal with Hawkeye and the NBA, and they're kind of wrestling with second spectrum now, and they'll have to pair those two data sources together. And I think it might be a couple of years before we're sure of what we're getting out of the Hawkeye data in a new sport. And then I think that you also have to consider things not only related to a player's performance, but the player as a 
as a physical athlete, right? You're trying to think about things like injury. You want to think about how a player is going to age over time. You're using, you know, huge data sets of other comparable players to try to get an understanding of that. It's going to be imperfect. And, you know, I think about the sort of biomechanical data that teams have access to and how useful that would be on the public side, obviously not something that we're going to be able to incorporate into public side projections, but you know, we are trying to do a version of that to understand, you know, what is the difference from between a guy who's 21 versus 31 versus 41? You know, we've had a lot of baseball players by now, so we can have some kind of sense of some of that stuff. And uh, one of the fun things for me about data science, and I don't know how many of the people in this audience are like skilled uh, people who can like write models or not, but it's uh, it's almost like magic. But certainly the fun part is you can have somebody come up with an idea. Like I think uh, their eye color has something to do with their performance or how high they kick their front leg. So you get hundreds of people coming up to you saying, I have different ideas. But with data science, if you have enough, you can run it through model and it'll tell you, do you have enough uh, sample size for it to be uh, measurable or not as part of like the explanation? Is it helpful to the model or not to be more accurate? So the fun thing is you could try different ideas and pretty quickly see if there's signal or no signal and how relative that is to all the other ideas. Um, I know there's any, uh, I guess the other thing is I've been sitting here a little bit yesterday and today, uh, like biomechanics, for example, is one of the big trends. Uh, video, another big trend, um, recording, uh, you know, measuring from sensor devices. Um, you know, what, what are some of the, like the actual data sources? I think you were mentioning StatCast and uh, biomechanical. Yeah, I, I just think biomechanical data will take over in the next few years. I think it's it's being less of a factor early on um, in this whole movement. And and there's an assumption that baseball is, is leading the pack in most things in this space, and they are. Um, but if we look at cricket, for example, um, they've got, uh, they've been looking at a lot of things that are now just beginning to be looked at in baseball. Um, yeah, I don't really have a, a, a big thing to add to that. I mean, I think we're going to be always limited on the public side to the sources that we have, um, even within like the universe of StatCast, it isn't as if public side analysts have access to the entire suite of data that teams do. I do think that there's some value in, you know, public projection systems being a bit simpler because I think that, you know, and there are some public projection systems that are quite complicated to the point of, I think, arguably being say overfit, one could, <laughs> one could say, just to reference Ben's um, Saber award-winning piece. But I think having the simplicity of a system can sometimes be a useful barometer for, you know, how meaningful is the data that you're actually getting out of it, so. Yeah, I mean, in addition even to that is just evaluating projection systems right. well is a very difficult thing to do. Right. Um, on the more technical side, you know, you think about like what your loss function is in a projection system and what is meaningful in an impact to a team or a client or, or anything along those lines. And, and these are interesting questions that like as you get into more complex data require more thought and care to not do things like overfit or uh, or or, you know, to project most players as average because it it reduces some rmse or something along those lines like there's there is nuance there that that's difficult to deal with and that that leads me to think you know, comparing different uh, forecasting systems this is always fascinating to me and i saw an article about 10 years ago that compared you know zip steamer dakota uh, major league equivalencies all of that but it's 10 years old so if anyone here ever wants to do an update, I, uh, you know, send it to me on LinkedIn, I'll uh, retweet it out. But uh, I haven't seen a modern update on when do you use different projection systems. And that that's the other fascinating thing is some projection systems were better um, if they were a rookie year. Others, you needed like five years of major league experience to start getting signals. Others would recognize if a player broke out positively, like uh, Aaron Judge, or broke down unexpectedly. So it's like different scenarios, different age. Some projection systems are better for younger versus old. And I liked what you're you're talking about, like the metrics to evaluate if uh, you know if a model is accurate or not. There's like R squared. There's all different metrics. But curious if anyone you know has any thoughts of like what type of metrics for evaluating the model are there and if you like one or another. 
I think that it's hard to go with any individual metric for evaluating models and to say that this is a perfect summary of how to uh, evaluate whether my projection system is good or not. I think, you know, oh, the way that I tend to think about it and want to think about it is what is useful for a client to be able to take uh, and and make uh, moves off of, right? Like to be able to make transactions off of. Uh, and so for me, thinking about model evaluation from a from a perspective of what is actually tangibly useful for a decision maker is something that lets me, you know, think about things with, within the evaluation sphere differently. So for example, you might not want to measure your average error on all players because some population of the players is, is uninteresting because they're unacquirable or something like that. Um, you know, but, but you might want to focus a lot of time on players projected in the like, in the like slightly above average to very above average and, and to suss out how to, um, how to rank those players and what the spread is between them. And so, you know, I think that this is a layer that in statistics is often uh, like a uh, cross your T dot your I. And within baseball, one of the beautiful things is that we have the ability to think about these problems with real tangible examples that we can recognize right away um, and identify when things look wrong or look correct. Uh, and taking advantage of that from a statistical lens is also su super interesting to me. Yeah, I, I think it's just important to think about the stakeholder on the other end, right? And and what is good enough for that situation in terms of model performance or just confidence in any prediction or projection. Um, so whoever has that the model output in their hands or the algorithm in their hands has to decide that they're going to communicate to the stakeholder in a way that they can understand or make a call on if they're confident in that in that projection and communicate as such. I don't know that I need to add anything. Sure. That. So yeah, Meg. Uh, yeah, speaking of that, we had a you know cool uh, conversations leading up to this, and you know, one of the great things in your position being you know external focused. You know, for example, like the o, the Orioles, being, sure, like performing more, or Aaron Judge. Uh, you know, how how does that all make sense? So I think that, um, well, the first assumption that readers tend to make, and sometimes players for that matter, is that we hate your team and we don't. <laughs> um, I think that the the big challenge that um, public facing publications that have a projection system have is the the degree of statistical literacy in your readership is going to be really variable. And I think that there is a default assumption when a team dramatically outperforms, say, its playoff odds from early in the season that the model got something wrong. We made a mistake. And that's possible. So I don't mean to say that we don't need to evaluate the projections and make sure that, you know, they're rigorously based and they're making good assumptions and the data is good. But often what will happen when a team goes from having pretty low playoff odds to being in the postseason is that something remarkable happened or something bad happened to another team. You think about last year's Guardians. The Guardians social media account really enjoyed saying like how far they had come from a playoff odds perspective. And I think that players and teams, if they want to make bulletin board material out of like public facing projections, that's fine. I think being a baseball player is really hard. And if that gives you a little extra oomph when you're going in, cool. But in terms of how we talk about that with readers, it's like, yeah, maybe we got something wrong or maybe there's something about the Guardians or the teams they were playing against that happened and changed what we might expect from their performance. So you might remember that the Guardians were in a really close division race with the Twins and the White Sox. They went on a pretty great run. Those teams fell off. Their wins came against those teams. It was enough to sort of vault them into the postseason. They were a really young team, so they had a lot of young players whose projections might be kind of conservative because we're relying more on minor league data, right? They were you know, full of rookies, full of great rookies, right? It was fun to hear people say, you don't believe in the Guardians. And I was like, I'm pretty sure we were the only publication that had Stephen Kwan on our top 100, but sure, we don't believe in the Guardians, right? So they were young. They were really healthy the entire year and their competitors were really not, we've heard about how hurt the twins were, right? They were a really injured team. The Guardians, super healthy the entire year, which might be related to how young their roster was, right? So it's not that we had the Guardians wrong. I think that they had some things about their team that you know a projection system is going to look at kind of conservatively. Young players, 
we're going to look at bullpens and not assume that you're going to be like a, a terrific bullpen that's always going to have great performance in one run games. We're not going to know that the that the other teams in your division are going to get horribly hurt, right? Those things don't mean that the projection system is wrong. It means that there were some things that we were always going to be conservative about. And then there was a guardians team that went on like a 16 and three run against division competition. And so then they were in the postseason. And I, I think that there is a useful sort of reorientation of thinking about that in the public sphere. Maybe something's wrong with the system, but maybe you just watch something really cool happen. And maybe that's the way that we can think about those teams that go on, you know, incredible runs. If your favorite team like, rips off an 18 game win streak and you look at the odds and say, wow, they sure improved. Well, yeah, of course they did. They just won 18 games in a row. Like that's going to happen. Right. So I think that our challenge is helping people to understand that while still having humility around the fact that like we should evaluate our systems and we should make sure that we're making good decisions on the back end and are able to articulate what those decisions are so that people can understand them. Like, I think there's a lot of value in that and would be a lot of value in people being able to think more probabilistically, not just in baseball, but like society wide. So I, I think that's part of our project. I actually have a question about that. If you don't mind, isn't that what's supposed to happen where a typical projection system doesn't predict outliers. So when outliers happen, that's what we will experience. Right. I think that, yes. And I, I do think that um, I would hate to watch a baseball season where everything happened exactly as we projected it. That would be so boring, right? Like it's, it's a lot of fun when a player emerges who you weren't expecting a lot from and, you know, Maybe he has a new pitch and we're not going to know that zips doesn't know that he has a new pitch, but maybe he learned a new pitch and it unlocked something for him. Maybe, you know, instead of being limited to okay performance against one handedness of hitter, he can now dominate both. Like that's really exciting. Yeah. That, that's super exciting. And you know, players who have never played before you call someone up from the minors, they have minor league data and, uh, you know, we have minor league equivalencies, right. but it's like out, even outside of baseball, it's called cold start uh, forecasting. You're, you're Pepsi and you want to come out with a new product that hasn't come out before. How do you predict what will be a success a year from now or not? Same thing with a, a player and a hey, Meg, uh, like your, your thoughts of like uh, you predict it or your system predicting X, Y happened, whether it's like the presidential elections or anything in the world, it's like a psychological uh, you know, thing that a lot of people have to overcome. But yeah, cold start forecasting for people who have never played before is uh, fascinating to me. How do you project? And then at what point, uh, this is the, the crucial thing for teams, is like Trey Mancini was a great case. Somebody I personally, who's in the minors, uh, Dan Duquette said, pick your top minor league player to get called up. It's your call. Couldn't believe he just like, you just name them. I'll trust you on that one. And I looked at the whole minor league system and so I had all the evidence and reports and information, and I've had some players that come up and do terribly the first week, and they never had a chance and they're sent down. But with Trey specifically, his first game hits a home run, second game hits a home run, third game hits a home run, the fans love him. But even if he struck out every time, I still the projections and myself still would have uh, bent on that. But it's kind of the point, like at what, you know, what sample size is still good enough for, you know, and when do you have to keep refining the model? I I think, you know, as players enter the system, you have information about them. And, and maybe your information is just they're a baseball player, right? But, you know, that information is something that you can use for things like regression to the mean and, you know, ideas on how to project things that might look like outlier performances in a week or in two weeks or in a month or something along those lines. Uh, and by, by using a, a regression to the mean and, and, and other statistical methods properly, um, you can limit yourself uh, from, from straying too far from like what, a, what a reasonable projection is. You know, I think that, uh, we, we want to have a projection system that when a player enters, uh, you know, the college database, we can project them all the way up through to the time when they're in the major leagues, right? That's, that's the ideal. And as you gain more information, your projection will be more accurate, but that doesn't mean that you can't, uh, pretty reasonably say things about them early in their career, especially when you have statistics that are, reasonably stable, something like stuff or, you know, right. 
plays on defense that they make or, th- or things like that. There are, there are ways to capture player value quickly. Cool. So yeah, one, one other, yeah, that, that that's awesome. Um, and one other thing, just, uh, I went to a spring training game and everyone's watched on TV, the big changes and rules this year kind of ties into another projection system challenge, which is, is called data drift in the industry where the data is changing over time. Uh, like maybe the sticky stuff, the ball might be changing or um, steroids or not, or, you know, people, you know, pitchers due to the biomechanics revolution are throwing faster with more spin or more command, whatever it is, the, the, the data or the people or the way the game's being played is different. And then in terms of the rules, uh, I always risk raising of hands, but how many people think it's a good idea for the new pitch uh, timing clock? Um, and who who doesn't? Uh, all right. And uh, what about the 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 base size? Who, who likes that? The new one. Sure. And who doesn't? All right. Uh, I'll just do. Uh, how about one more? That limited pickoff move. People like it. People don't. Um, so yeah, these are like. And there's more. You know, shifts and stuff. There's uh, so many rules that are changing all at once, and that's one of the challenges with projections. Is if you uh, you have A/B uh, testing. You change one thing, leave everything else the same. Uh, but when you change four or five things in a row, it gets pretty hard to to calculate. So, I don't know, does anyone have any advice or thoughts on like data drift or when uh, in anything when more than one thing happens at once, or just as the data changes, how often do you want to recalibrate things? Well, I, I think a really good point was made earlier that it's useful to underreact to changes and yeah. take your time to integrate that new information because if you, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, you're going to end up all over the place. And I, I mean, I think my only other comment is that it's important to have a modern data stack because you can yeah. have mature machine learning models and adjust at the right pace. Yeah, I think that, you know, I said the word conservative earlier. I think that's the approach that a lot of projection systems are taking to, you know, rule changes. I do think we see some anticipated growth in stolen bases in, in a lot of projections, but, you know, think about, you mentioned sticky stuff. It's like, imagine if you had in, sort of rushed to incorporate spin into your projection system. And then it turns out that like, maybe spin is a mirage for a lot of guys because they, they have something on their hands. So you'd be sitting there assuming, you know, the relationship between that data point and future performance, but that data point might change. So I think you're, you might be a little slow to react, but you're going to avoid being burned more often if you take that approach than if you're like, yeah, there we go. Everybody can spin it for now. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there are a few things here that are interesting. Um, I mean, one is that Primarily, you are comparing players to other players with, within the same environment, especially, you know, if, if you are careful with like the time horizons of the models that you're building and things along those lines. And so you can appropriately pick up on on changes and, and things that are happening by but, but because your set is limited in this way. Um, and I think like, you know, for uh explicit rule changes there are pieces that are that are difficult but there is also an advantage to being able to pick up on things quickly and so while being conservative will often uh will often help you uh reduce error in the model or or something along those lines it goes back somewhat to what I talked about with stakeholders on the baseball side, which is, you know, you may want to to go out on a limb in these situations because they may create competitive advantages. And so being able to identify when errors are random and when errors are systematic uh, is is like a, a very important piece of designing a projection system, because when they're systematic, that means that there is something more that can be done there. And when they're random and it's, you know, the Orioles are great this year or, or Aaron Judge hits, you know, 62 home runs like that's that's the fun part of baseball. Right. You raise an important dynamic, though, is, is that rule changes affect everyone and some will respond better than others. But but we can take our time observing those changes. Yeah. Sweet. And, and by the way, people who raise their hand, it seemed like the, the majority, vast majority, were in favor of some of the rule changes. It's pretty neat. I went to the fastest game that I had been in possibly in my life. It was two minutes and oh, two hours and three minutes. <laughs> like, wow. 
two minutes uh, during the seventh inning stretch. I thought that was a bit fast. They should add a few more minutes in between just for that. But um, yeah, it was, it, it's going to be you know quite different. I'm, I'm excited to see how all the projection systems change and the teams that are more agile that can understand these subtle differences and uh, account for it uh, are going to be at a, a good advantage for many, many years. And then uh, Jake, you, you mentioned modern data stack. Um, like, like what are your things, uh, you know, thoughts either on that or like how, how you collect data, store data, serve it up? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to do there and, and Nick will speak better on this than I could, but I, I just think recently there's been so many advances and bigger industries are taking advantage a little bit faster. I think for sports team owners, just hiring a lot of people that know this domain has been enough for them. And now they realize that they have to modernize their, their systems and processes um, as well as the technology. So, you know, having a cloud and having the right kind of data engineering process and having the right kind of model architecture is going to be very important to get answers fast enough um, and have people understand it. Yeah. I mean, I think this, the simple thing is, is, treating things like projection systems as products that a company like Apple or Google would treat as their, as their products do, right? It is, you know, these are things that have to be, have to be carefully managed. They have to be deployed properly. Um, instead of more ad hoc work, you want things to be in a, in a more modern framework. And there are lots of people, you know, studying and working on this prob problem. And I think that Zealous has a very good stack. And so teams should uh, contact us. <laughs> But, Absolutely. And, and I mean, it's important to remember, like, the end user doesn't care how we got there. They don't. They don't care about the underlying numbers. They don't care about how hard you worked on the algorithm. They have a jobs to be done framework, and they have questions that they want answered. So setting up a system that's going to help us get there is, is important. And part of that modern data stack is, like, traditional databases, like Oracle had structured data, you know, numbers and uh, text and, and things like that, characters, booleans. And then the more modern is like what you're seeing with other presentations, you now have video, like unstructured data. You have biomechanical markers, three-dimensional dots moving around. You even have like scouting reports, text and things like that. So, you know, having all one system. And, and the other thing is the less modern, you call it legacy, you would have structured in one software, unstructured like video in another. So you'd have two different models that don't incorporate them both. So the more modern sports companies and uh, vendors uh, organize them all in a combined system. But I don't know, anyone have thoughts on how unstructured data, scouting reports, medical information, biomechanics can help with these projection systems? Well, the way you explained that made me think why Databricks has usage-based pricing. Yeah, <laughs> the There's more a lot you of use, the more data. you pay, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I, think, um, I think a lot of unstructured data is, is difficult to start dealing with. And so this is why I think, you know, companies want to have sophisticated and robust like baseball systems teams essentially like data engineers people who are who are thinking about and and working on these problems you know the number one piece of of kinematic and biomechanic data getting that into projection systems and into uh into more popular metrics is actually ingesting the data i mean it's it's very difficult time series data that you're getting markers stamped you know 60 times a second 120 times a second uh, for many different body parts and has to be sequential. And so a, a lot of this data is difficult to work with um, and, and is a problem that is being solved more on the data engineering side at this point. And that will allow sort of the analytics layer to, to thrive. Uh, something like, like unstructured scouting data, uh, you know, there are methods to deal with text and, and they're becoming more robust and you're probably seeing them more and more in the like in the public sphere at this point. I think that's the that's a similar thing that can be applied in baseball is is ways to ways to leverage ideas from other industries that are also dealing with these things um, and apply them to baseball data. Uh, and then and then you get to get the benefit of of baseball data, which is like knowing if you've applied them correctly, because if the players come out in a, in a reasonable order, you feel pretty good. I already mentioned cold start situations, and I think different data types will result in different expectations and different time horizons 
on outputs and actual value derived. So I think it's important to communicate um, when you might get something out of a new data set and how those might be integrated into a system. You mentioned what's not in your model. And I think right. people probably don't appreciate that. Right. And this is, I'm not about to give you my um, thoughts on a modern stack. That's a little bit beyond my purview, but I will say that when we look at team hiring, I think one of the sort of unsung limitations for being able to implement what you're talking about is that if you're a really smart computer science person, you're going to make a lot more money working anywhere else than in baseball. And so there is sort of a challenge in trying to both at attract and retain folks who can do that kind of work, which is essential. It's not, you know, I think a lot of fan graphs readers who aspire to work in a front office, they think of themselves as a future GM. This kind of work is really important to anyone in a front office being able to utilize that data. And if you're going to make 50K working for a team, or you can make 200K working in Silicon Valley, that discrepancy is going to cause a problem for teams. So I, I think that that is an sort of underappreciated barrier to getting really good work done. We could do a whole panel on that yeah. topic. <laughs> and we will get to, uh, you know, job advice in a little bit, but yeah, that, that, that is one of the challenges is keeping, retaining talent, trying to stay ahead of other and some organizations, um, you know, have owners that are willing to pay whatever it takes to get the most modern uh, advanced uh, so a team in place and technology in place. And yeah, like what you're saying, like with other sports, uh, was it Madden football you worked with? Jake uh, worked in, was it rugby, cricket? I don't know, any thoughts on advice from other uh, other sports that could apply to baseball? I think that generally the idea of sports analytics is pretty similar across sports, right? It's like, it's, it's the idea of analytics in, in general, which is, you know, derive uh, insight from, from the data, like the, the, the thing that's, that's very cool about Zealous is that we get to uh, work in a number of different sports at the same time. And so ideas that work in other sports can then be applied differently. And so things like athleticism measures or, 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 or uh, you know, or movement in some in some capacity if they're solved in one sport they can start to be applied more broadly to other sports um and and that's just like an, an interesting piece of the equation uh but at the end of the day all of these sports are trying to answer the same question which is how good are these players that i'm watching and which ones are going to continue to be good in the future uh and and that's like that's the main impetus behind projection systems is is you know how good are these guys how can i acquire the best ones so that my team is good in the future yeah nick's absolutely right i mean when we look at our soccer customers or our rugby partners the idea of having 30 computer computer science graduates working for us is a complete fantasy um so you know soccer teams that have three analysts um they have to get more creative so i think um Look at baseball, yes, but look at talent identification in soccer. Look at tactics in rugby. Look at biomechanics in cricket, and you'll learn quite a lot. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. Speaking of other sports, so uh, you know, second spectrum. If you Google second spectrum TED Talk, one of my <laughs> favorites, and that deals with basketball and the NBA. And for me, the most fun part of data science. And analytics uh, has merged into what you call feature engineering. So the speech before, how did what part of the video that they look at could predict if someone's tipping a pitch? And this is creating new data out of raw data um, and, and, uh, to create new factors that then go into a model and you can see how is somebody potentially tipping their pitches in what situation. So that second spectrum example is at first, you get raw data like StatCast. It's moving dots. You don't even know they're, they're people or not. Then you have humans that know the game of baseball, or in this case, the NBA, that can say this pattern of moving is a jump shot. This pattern of moving is a dunk. This pattern of movement is a pick and roll when there's more than one player. And then you can even further extract a pick and roll when you're in a close game, pick and roll when you're not in a close game. So same thing in baseball. You can now take Statcast or raw video and look at where was the catcher setting up? Um, how quickly did, or what was the route efficiency and fielding um, or route efficiency and fielding only when it, it was not like a easy, lazy fly ball. So you start coming up with these features, putting it into a projection system or a model, then you get a result. And it says that that piece of information was 
helpful, it improved it by 0.01%, or it's helpful and improved it by you know 3%. And you just try things over and over and over again and continually improve your model. So every one of the teams in spring training this year, I can bet you, is looking at the new type of data and having these uh, convergent conversations of you know what the new base sizes mean, how can we change our play to adjust to it? Yeah, and as an analyst, sort of similar to anything else, what you want to do is stand on the shoulders of the people before you, right? Like you, you don't want to have to resolve every problem. And so whether this is other sports or, or even just other industries um, in general, you know, you can find people who have, who have attempted to use data in, in any number of ways. Pe people have been using video data and, and are continuing to iterate on it. And so you don't have to start from scratch with any, with any data source. You, you have, the ideas of of people who have tried this before you, um, and you know that is that's it's it's such a a fast start for for things like video data or text data or 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 implementations of you know movement patterns or things along those lines. Maybe I'm the boring contrarian. I, I think there's a lot of exciting new stuff, but I think we can use what's already there a lot better and make it more accessible. So I think, you know, there's there's lots of uh, value hiding in plain sight. So yes, absolutely. Look at what people have already been looking at and just do it a little bit better. Well, and I think for, for a lot of um, at least public facing projection systems, like I say this and then we're going to have some incredible breakthrough, but like the you know, the advances in the early days of projections were so significant. And now, you know, you're, you're trying to get more and more precise, but I think the, you know, each individual upgrade on average is going to be of a smaller magnitude, just because a lot of the low hanging fruit has been picked. Cool. So I'd love to hear from each of you, like what, one of the general questions is, all right, so we have data, we have analytics, we have players and coaches, like, and then I hear there's some teams that have 20, 30, 40 people in their data slash analytics staff. How do they all work together? So uh, I want to hear, like, what are your, like, how does a team of people collaborate and work, whether it's at an actual team or if it's at your company itself and you want to talk about that, either one, uh, I'd love to hear some more about that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, it is a great thing to work in baseball and in sports in general because you are often working with people who are incredibly passionate about the same thing that you are passionate about, right? Uh, as was alluded to, you're probably not making uh, as much money as as you could make elsewhere. And so the people who are actively making that choice to, to work in sports are, are people who care about sports. And so it's it's easy almost to work with people because when you bring them a problem that is interesting within the realm of baseball or within the realm of sports in general, they, they get curious about it. They want to, they want to answer it. Like what I have found is that, is that everyone I have worked with in, in my time in the sports industry is curious and likes to ask questions, likes to answer questions, likes to have theories on different things. And that allows for a lot of collaboration. Um, and so, you know, do things have to be structured properly to allow and foster collaboration? Yes. Yeah. You, you should, uh, you know, have an environment uh, overall that, that fosters that, but but in general, the people that you work with, the people that you talk to are, are very passionate. And so it allows for it allows for iteration on products very quickly because you are able to uh, you're able to generate far more ideas as a group and and adds forward as a group than than any individual could. Yeah, like you said, curiosity is so important. And most of us are very curious people. And I think we should just always think about whoever we're addressing as a stakeholder, whoever's questions we're answering, make sure that we're addressing the person and then the process and then the technology in that order. Because often we can get lost in an algorithm. We can get lost chasing that next insight. And we're actually not addressing someone's someone's job, someone's curiosity. I mean, I think the the job of sports media is in a lot of ways very different than what you're describing, but I think the the curiosity piece is where there's a lot of commonality. Like I see our role as 
asking interesting questions, telling a good story, and hopefully having a reader of the site come away knowing something they didn't know before they started reading a piece. And that starts with curiosity. That starts with, I wonder how that works. Let me see if I can go figure it out. And so projections are one way that we try to answer those questions or a lot of others. But I think at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. Let's ask something interesting and then try to answer it in an interesting way. Great. So I have two more questions. And then I think that'll give us some time for q and I already see a few coming across. So start asking them or start thinking of them. Um, but yeah, so a lot of you are in the industry. A lot of you are here to look for jobs getting into the market. So uh, hoping everyone could give some advice to job seekers. I think one of the most important things that I learned early on, if you want to be a sports statistician, a sports analyst specifically, is to fall in love with the statistics and analytics part as much as you probably already love the sports part. Um, so, you know, at, at one point in college, I wanted to be able to do this and I, and I really loved sports and I, I was majoring in statistics, you know, it was, it was a thing that I thought could lead to this. Uh, and when I sort of, when I, when I delved into it from a perspective that wasn't just applying it to sports and tried to understand what was going on and, and to be passionate about, um, about things like building models for their own sake or or things like you know structuring code properly or, or anything along those lines that was an extremely helpful moment in in upping my sports analytics game as well because it allows you to uh to take from both sides right to to take a model that you think is really interesting and that you're passionate about and then find a sports problem that relates to it and then you know pursue that that as a, as a joint endeavor rather than trying to like have a sports problem and hoping that your statistics education is enough you know i think that's that's one of the the most important things is is figure out if you if you truly love statistics and analytics and if that's the path for you within sports uh, because that's that's important. That that is the the core piece to being able to be successful uh, within the sports analytics industry. The other is if you really want a sports job, be a software engineer who's willing to not make that much money. <laughs> that was the first thing I was going to say. Um, yeah, the subjective is is build quality of relationships rather than quantity. It is a, a people industry um, and get really good at dealing with rejection and doubt and disappointment um, and then build resilience, like just keep going over and over and over. The objective part I think is, is do something of value. Like as much as it's important that people like you and that you are a person that people want to work with. Um, we all have stories of, of someone who got picked up by a team because they had a great conference poster or came up with a variable or published a paper. Go be that person. There's tons of things the teams are thinking about saying, oh, I'd love to have some insight on that or some expertise on that. Go find out about it and go become an expert about it and someone will, will pick you up. I guess I'd say if you're going to try to take the path of working on the public side in sports media as an avenue to getting a team job. You need to care about writing. Like I, I, we could do an entire panel about how, you know, there isn't enough of an emphasis in STEM fields on being able to actually communicate in writing. We get a lot of contributor applications from very smart people who are doing cool work and could never in a million years explain what it means to a reader. It's a whole generation actually. Well, I, I just think that there's, you know, there's less of an emphasis on it than there could be. And I, I know sometimes that makes people roll their eyes, but if you're working on the team side, you're still going to have to communicate internally. You're still going to have to be persuasive. You're still going to have to explain your ideas. You might not be doing that in a 1500 word post with some gifts thrown in, although maybe you are like, that sounds fun. But if you can't communicate that stuff to an audience, you're not going to find purchase on the public side, at least as a writer. So it, it does matter. It matters how you're able to communicate your ideas and you know, you can be really, really smart, but if you can't help someone understand what you're saying, it's going to be hard for you to find a writing role. So keep that in mind and like read a lot because that tends to make people good writers in my experience. Yeah, I just want to add to that. That is that is so important. Like I wasn't being flippant. I, I think we haven't been taught enough about writing as a generation in school. Um, and, you know, I get about five LinkedIn messages or emails a day asking for a job. And if I can't figure out in the first three seconds who you are, how you add value and what you're asking me for, mm -hmm. I won't read it. 
Yeah, great, great point. That that was I was going to add on my own advice, but yeah, be, you are your own brand, and yeah. just being able to say succinctly, um, you know, any of them, like who are you? Either what makes you unique or not unique, but at least how how are you going to help them uh, do their job better? If it's a specific skill, or if you don't have those specific skills, you know, you you have determination. You always follow through, but you know, more specifically, and 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 then for skills, there's a couple different sets. The nice thing is teams are large enough now that you could be one or two of everything from being a SQL developer, which is getting data into a database, to being um, a data scientist, which is writing like predictive models, to being a person who doesn't have the programming skills, but they're the communicator, someone who can work with the athletes or the coach, or just a coordinator. You may not know how the projection systems work, um, but you're making sure that they're updated, they're in place, they're working, the right people are in the right place doing the right things. And then I guess the other you know, few things that come to mind, if you have not heard of Teamwork Online, it's a, a website where pretty much every major uh, job opportunity across all the sports are listed. That site didn't exist a couple of years ago, but go there, see if there's any type of job in that spectrum um, out there in the front office and the analyst department. See, um, you know, apply for them if you think you're ready. And if not, look at what the requirements are. If it says you need Python or R or SQL and you don't have that, then try learning it on your own. Take a course, watch you, uh, YouTube. Um, and if it's for you, great. If it's not, then keep looking at other jobs that have the skills you may have. Can I disagree with you there? So okay. great, great tip to read the job descriptions and then build those skills that like everyone should do that. But I've never gotten a job that I've applied for or that I've seen online in my 33 years. Um, find out who are the people who you want to be like, and you want to be in their position someday, get in touch with them however you can. And usually I'll answer after the third or fourth time someone writes me. So keep going and then find out what headache they have and go solve. And that's a good point. You can also create your own job opportunity. Um, you know, some people have that in them. Like you just have that relationship and you're like, you are not doing this. I can help you with that. Um, th that that works a lot of times as well. So open job descriptions, one route, um, just busting down the door and, and making making your own destiny is another. So, so yeah, th this is great. And um, yeah, also tomorrow morning, there's going to be like networking for for more job opportunity advice as well. If you want to come uh, early, I'll I'll be there as well. And then the the last question, and I see more Q and A coming in, and I guess they could come to the mic or shout out. But get your questions ready. Is like what's next? Projection systems, baseball technology. I think the continued integration of things like biomechanics data are are probably the the next frontier for massive strides um as far as the next frontier for like for smaller strides it's it's hard to tell um you know there are there are interesting things discussed i think you know most uh days in a in a front office or at a sports analytics company that have potential um you know there there is certainly not every uh, every problem in baseball solved something like, you know, command or, or, or things along those lines are, are difficult problems that are probably still open at least most places. Um, you know, and so I think that there is a lot of opportunity on, on new problems, but there's also, you know, to continue on the advice train, there's also more, you know, ability to, to, rehash problems that that already have some solution and and to try to do them in a in a clean and clear way and communicate them effectively and you know that perhaps can make small gains and so uh so i think i think there are a lot of things that could be next and it's it's hard to tell what's going to be next on the on the shorter term side on the longer term side you know a, a lot of this work with with the new data sets is is often what is going to to breakthrough uh, for new levels of projection systems. Great. Yeah, I think it's productizing data pipelines, which I know we keep talking about, and I know it's boring, but it's really important. It's going to be foundational models, and it's going to be things like scenario testing, where we're at the end state for the user, and they have insights, and now they want to do something else with it. Um, so obviously, I'm, I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid here, but you know, part of our mission is to empower um, 
moderately technical executives. So there's a lot of assistant general managers in baseball who have a finance background or, or they have a master's in statistics, but they don't build machine learning models anymore. Um, but they can sit in a dashboard and they can ask what if questions of a model. So I think putting those kinds of insights, like you talked about with new types of reports in, in the hands of stakeholders, I think will help us get more out of what's already there. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Well, yeah, the, the great thoughts. So we'll open it up. I think we have like 12 minutes or so for more Q&A. Um, and I have some from people on Zoom for everyone who's online. I think there are multiple hundreds of you. Thank you for being part of here. But does anyone uh, in person have any questions? I don't know what you're Just hold on to the microphone. Um, my question is in regards to contract negotiations that the in arbitration or in a free agency uh, regard, how important is it, or what's the balance between uh, use of descriptive statistics versus use of predictive statistics? Because a lot of times from the player side, we'll use descriptive as in, this is what I've done at this point, I can't predict the future, but I have a fairly good sample size here versus a team who may be more likely to use a predictive system where we use that data and we put it in our system to predict future productivity. And ultimately, that's the million dollar question. Uh, so what is the balance between use of descriptive versus predictive systems? I think it has to be predictive moving forwards. Um no pun intended, like, you know, last weekend, Ari and I were at MIT Sloan, probably a lot of people here were there as well. And um, Joe Cadrona uh, is the long snapper for the New England Patriots, and, and he's getting kind of old, and he's a free agent. And, and the Patriots are saying, well, nobody's done it at this age. And he's saying, well, I can, and I will, but we don't have a model for that. So that's, that's like the exception that proves the rule. But I think eventually, you know, most contract negotiations will feature around that kind of discussion. Yeah, I think that, you know, in, in general, uh, an intelligent team will want to pay for what the person is going to do on the contract that, that they actually get the person to. And so they're going to be looking predictive. Uh, you did mention ARB, which yeah. is different and weird, but has some descriptive statistics used as well. Uh, and ARB is essentially like a fight to find how you can reduce the player's value the most. And so if that's descriptive, great. And if it's predictive, great. Uh, so like, that's the one scenario where maybe there's some descriptive use if it benefits the team. Well, and there is some actual, there are some bumpers put into that process by the collective bargaining agreement about what you can actually bring into an ARP hearing. Um, but yeah, I mean, teams are trying to get less, players are trying to get more, and you're often in front of an arbiter who's experience with baseball and with advanced analytics can be wildly variable. And so I know that has been a point of frustration for players and agents as they've tried to navigate that process, because often even very smart teams are going to rely on stats that they aren't using to make actual roster decisions to try to low ball a player. That's, that's a huge point. Yeah. And I think agencies will start employing more data scientists. And a lot of them are, but when you're up against both a front office and then the league's LRD, like it, it can feel like a, a big mismatch, I think, especially for guys repped by smaller agencies. Thank you. Yeah, great question. So I'll alternate online and in person. So one really good one online was how the men mental approach, personality, um, you know, th those types of abilities, like the non-measurable on the field, how does that affect or does it uh, projection systems? I think often uh, you, a a as a projection system, I, I, I often think of the way that decisions are made as, as layered. Um, so the projection system is not just the end all be all. And that, that is the only thing that is considered, right? Uh, it, it's often a good jumping off point to, to adjust from. And, you know, if it's on, I don't know what, what scale, the, the WOBA scale, you might adjust it a couple points up or a couple points down based on other factors or things that you think that you're missing. And so you can be, uh, you can be nimble within uh within the context of what your actual projection says to allow you to have a nice space that's a good foundation and to move off of those but i also think that often a lot of the things that uh that can't be measured should should eventually uh trickle into things that actually happen on the field of play 
Uh, and so, you know, the hope is that eventually you do measure those things by the player actually performing better in clutch situations or w- whatever it may be from, from the mental side. Yeah, baseball is unique, but in most team and field sports, there are athletes who make everyone around them better, but we can't measure how. Um, and Ari's question, I mean, that's the first question you get at a barbecue when you say work in analytics, right, is how do we factor for if a player is a jerk or if they're lazy? And the answer is we can't, or if we can, it's really hard. And Nick mentioned free text from scouting reports like that. That should be used more and more, I think. With the caveat that you have to be careful to not introduce bias into your understanding of a player, because at the end of the day, it is people doing those evaluations. And since there isn't something quantifiable, maybe they have a really good sense of it, or maybe they don't like that kind of person. And it's coloring their understanding of what that you know player is going to do on the field. We make a point. I mean, we don't have data that would be particularly useful in that endeavor, but I know that Dan reminds readers every year that he does not put his thumb on the scale of zips. Like he might disagree with a projection, but it, it just is what it is. And then I think the job of writers is to look at some of the other factors that might influence, you know, how a guy is perceived on his team, or, you know, we might know that a player suffered a family loss and that perhaps he's just going to have a down year because he's dealing with grief. Like we can know those things. It's hard to teach the computer that. Yeah, but yeah, some things you can measure, some things you can't, some you can factor in, some you couldn't. Um, like one example, like Hunter Pence, when we were evaluating him to come up, there are, of course, many physical uh, attributes that made him an incredible player. But believe it or not, about half of the scouts said, no, he's not major league quality. About half of them did. They, the GM uh, turned to me and said, are you the deciding factor? So, of course, I said, I'll let you know in a couple of days. And I didn't want to give an answer in front of everyone, but looked in the one kind of, I guess you could call it mental, but it was quantifiable, was how well he adjusted to pitchers compared to other people in his peers at AAA Round Rock. So you may call that mental, but it was, if you're willing to adjust, um, a lot of players are stubborn and they've always been the best uh, in the high school, college, and they don't adjust and they might have the raw skills to last in the majors, but you need to be able to adjust uh, generally to succeed after multiple years. And he was in like the top 2% of all AAA players that would get better in a certain way against opposing pitchers compared to the peers. So that at least said he has the humbleness to be willing to take um, constructive feedback differently, which I guess could be a mental uh, approach. But that, that, that's a, that was a great question. Uh, any, uh, how about you? And, mentioned the writing skills. The other thing I'd like to point out is presentation skills. I'd like to see more passion. Think like Dallas Brady. Uh, he was the most passionate guy I've seen here. And uh, the other thing is please don't show spreadsheets without graphs on on the uh, fly decks. And I wouldn't show you to tell a joke on the line. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone know any good jokes <laughs> on that note? Yeah, well, um, how about uh, you? Yeah, just to, to build off your, your last point about changes in individual characteristics and, and skill set, right? I'll take the player like Jeff O'Neill, mm-hmm. who said like 2021, 2020, 2021, he was trying to hit home runs in 2022. Yeah. Right? How do you think about players, in part of projection system, think about players that are systematically undergoing changes in their profile? Do we need the projection systems to take into account whenever a guy goes to the right? Do you need to follow on Twitter and a player goes to the right and you get his projections to follow? How, how do we think about that? We don't. <laughs> I mean, not that we don't think about that when we, as say writers, are trying to make an argument for why. Jeff McNeil might outperform why this pitcher might do better than his under his baseline projection suggests. We know that, right? We know he went to driveline. We know he's throwing a splitter. Now we know that this guy has more loft in his swing. How do you tell the system that, right? We don't want to overreact to those changes. First of all, we don't know if they're going to work. There are a lot of guys who learn a new pitch and they're still not a good pitcher. There are a lot of guys who have tweaked their swings and they're good for a little while. And then the league adjusts and they can't adjust back. So I think this is a spot again, where you want to have sort of a, a reticence to rush into change with something like that, because the great thing about them playing the, the season is that eventually we will know how those things 
you know, impact their game. And the projections do take those stats into account, right? So in a way, we will learn that. Like, I'm, I'm sure that if you were to look at McNeil's sort of projections before he came up and his projections now in terms of the long-term in Zips, I bet they're wildly different, right? And so we have a mechanism for reacting to that data. It just takes a little bit longer than saying, ah, you went to driveline, so that's definitely going to work. Driveline works with a lot of guys and they do good work, but not all of those guys pan out. I agree with the take, but maybe you just created a new job. Someone can build a scraper. Someone goes to driveline or someone trains with Eric Cressy. They're less likely to have a shoulder injury the next year. Yeah, so I saw a great question from Parker online. Um, but basically, do you need experience or how important is baseball experience um, to getting a job, to being effective projection systems or being uh, you know, valuable member? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, I don't, I think that there is sort of some intent to, to not uh, overvalue ba baseball experience so that you uh, qualified candidates. I think that, you know, w when I think about baseball analytics jobs, the easiest part of the job to teach is baseball, not analytics. Um, and so being qualified in the analytics portion of the job and having projects, whatever they may, they might be in, uh, is, is certainly the foundation. And then the baseball part, whether it's either, whether it's passion or knowledge of the game, that, that part is easy to teach. That's, that's something that, you know, uh, that, that almost anyone can pick up. Great. I worked in pro rugby for two years before I understood the rules. <laughs> I think good, pe good people who are resilient, you know, we talked about just building skills, demonstrate value. That's what's important. Well, yeah. I think, oh, no, go ahead. I think we've come a long way in understanding that you don't have to have been a high level player to know the ins and outs of baseball, right? You don't have to have been a high level player to have a passion for the game. I think that, um, we still have work to do to really be sort of following through on that promise of hiring the best people. And I think that, again, we could have an entire panel about the challenges in really making the game look like the people who care about it because it doesn't. Um, but I think that there are a lot of really smart baseball people who come from a lot of different places. I did not play little league. I am just old enough that it wasn't always a guarantee that girls were going to get to do that. You do not want to see my swing. It is horrifyingly <laughs> bad. So I think there, there are a lot of ways to get at that. If you can bring the appropriate skills and have a passion for the game, that doesn't have to have come from high level experience. I will say, I appreciate very much that teams, when they do want to emphasize that, you know, some amount of playing experience is useful to their process, they do take pain now to emphasize that you know that can be high level baseball or softball playing you know you can you can kind of <laughs> wing it right so um i do think that there are efforts on the team side to try to make sure that we're not just hiring one kind of person but we still have a lot of work to do in that regard great and yeah once i was uh, in a finalist interview for gm and i was this is a while ago was told uh you know hey you never played major league baseball therefore you can't be in that position. And now it's like almost the opposite where teams want people who know the, the sport and the industry since they can do these feature engineering in the context, but they also want some teams, people who have, don't know anything about baseball, since sometimes it might trigger innovative thinking, um, uh, you know, different uh, zero, you know, principle analysis where uh, maybe they're thinking something differently that could be helpful. Not a guarantee, but it's great to have a well-rounded group of people with all different experiences. Um, and I wish everyone uh, their best in getting the job. But Scott uh, said this is the end of it. So I wanted to thank everyone. I'll personally be around today and tomorrow. Uh, so some of the other panelists might be. But um, yeah, so come up, ask questions you didn't have a chance to ask. Be happy to address them. And I wanted to thank the panelists and for your time. Yeah, thank you.